Good morning, everyone. This is John Shaw, the director of the Paul Simon Public Policy Institute at Southern Illinois University. Happy New Year and welcome to another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. And today we're really delighted to be joined by one of the most interesting and dynamic ambassadors working in Washington, the Swedish ambassador, Karen Olesdotter. Uh, the ambassador has a really interesting and rich career. Um, she grew up in a town called Holmstead, uh, which is in Western Sweden. She attended Lund University. Uh, she graduated from there in 1994 for interesting uh, studies in both psychology, economics, and Russian. Uh, interesting array of courses. We'll talk to her about that. She then entered Sweden's Foreign Service, which is one of the most respected and distinguished in the world. Very, very highly regarded. And has had this remarkable career. She, uh, her first posting was in Moscow, where she worked on security issues. She worked in Brussels at the Sweden's uh, mission to the EU. She was uh, Sweden's ambassador to Hungary. Uh, she served uh, prior to this stint in Washington as the number two person in the Swedish embassy and has had some really important jobs in Stockholm. She was served as the chief of staff for three foreign ministers and has been their director of trade. And she came to the United States again uh, in 2017 to become Sweden's ambassador, the first woman ambassador. And I will say the ambassador has a, a rich connection to the United States. She, she came to here first as a high school student, as an exchange student uh, in New Jersey, outside of Atlantic City. She attended UCLA for a year studying economics and management. Uh, she was here as the number two person, as I mentioned, and then she's, she came back in 2017 as the ambassador, so really knows the United States well, and is joining us from the Swedish Embassy in Washington. So good morning, Ambassador. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Well, tell us a little bit about growing up uh, in, in Sweden. I mean, you're from a town, Holmstad, if I pronounce that correctly. I think it's about 70,000 people in the Western. Oh, no, it's bigger. It's is 90, it bigger now? 90. 90, okay. Well, <laughs> a Wikipedia is out of date then. They said 70,000. But uh, tell us a little bit about the community. I think your parents were small business owners. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about growing up uh, in Sweden. Well, thank you. Well, I was born in the mid-60s. I'm born in 1966. So it was a, an era in the 70s. Of course, we had an oil crisis that affected the Swedish economy. But for, for the rest of it, we, we were doing well. Uh, and I think my parents are a product of the Swedish, uh, Swedish welfare society. They were born early 1930s. Uh, they have only been six years in school. But uh, through hard work and, and uh, being very business-like, they, they were in the shoe business. So they actually had uh, three shoe stores together. And my mother... Uh, ran one of the most exclusive shoe stores in Sweden, I would say. And I'm not just saying that. It really was. She had customers from all over. And, and Halmstad is a very much of a summer town. It's a beach town with an enormous beach. And for you Americans, maybe it sounds weird that we actually get uh, in the summertime up to 23 or 25 degrees Celsius in the water swimming there. So it's the Gulf Stream, you know, that goes by. Anyway, so they were, they were quite successful. And um, I mean, in a small way. Uh, and given that they themselves didn't have any education, but they had an, a very international outlook and they started traveling early. So, you know, late 60s, we went on charter trips to Spain. My father, they don't speak English, but my father was, you know, uh, an agent for shoe brands from Spain and Austria. And he went there without speaking a word of English or Spanish or anything and did fine. So they have always been very encouraging of me traveling and, and traveling with them. I'm an only child as well. Uh, so I think that all these things combined somehow made me end up where I am today. So I am extremely grateful for them. And I still think today, if you follow me on Facebook, you will see when I'm in Halmstad, because I always post pictures of the most beautiful beach in the world, uh, according to me. Uh, it is actually stunning. And I think it would surprise a lot of you uh, that, it, uh, that we have such a beach life in, in Sweden. Windsurfing, though, not surfing. <laughs> well, tell us about your three majors, psychology, economics, and Russian. Yeah. Um, was that in preparation? At that point, had you decided that you wanted to uh, pursue a career in diplomacy? No, or... no, 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 no. I still pinch my arm to this day that I became a diplomat. I had no idea what I wanted to do. This is late 80s. I started at the university, and I wanted to do... It's a long story about how Swedish university system works. It was a lottery at the time. So if you had uh, passed uh, your high school diploma, 
then it was a lottery to if you wanted to make your own education, so to speak. So uh, I wanted to study political science. But at that time, that in the late 80s, that became extremely popular. So in the lottery, uh, I didn't make that lottery. So I ended up with psychology instead. And I loved it. So I always thought I would go back to study political science, but I never did. So uh, I, I really liked psychology. And then I did economics, as you said, and business administration. And then I got a job as tour guide in Russia without having, then you didn't need to speak Russian for that. But I really, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with St. Peter's or Leningrad at the time. And I was so fascinated by it. So then I went there in 1991 to study Russian. Uh, so I lived there for eight months uh, and I can assure there was no food. It was very tough, but I still just loved it and the Russian people and the culture and everything. And uh, then I had, a, it's kind of an after construction of what I wanted to do. I was, because then the Soviet Union fell in August there in 91. And there were so many, you know, international companies who wanted to invest in Russia. So I thought I would work with human resources and uh, and uh, retraining of their of personnel uh, in in Russia because I realized that was something they needed. But uh, and I, I before I, I joined, the, I actually got such a job uh, with a company in Denmark. Uh, but then uh, there were no jobs in Sweden at the time because we had an, had an, a huge economic crisis. Uh, we actually had an interest rate of five hundred percent at the time <laughs> because yeah so huge economic crisis. But um, then uh, the only job that was advertised basically was the uh, diplomatic uh, training course. Uh, so I thought I, I was like, I will never get this. I'll send in my application. Will never happen. 2000 people apply, you know, 20 get the job. I stand no chance. But because of my Russian studies, uh, they were interested in me. And then they were really interested in that I had studied psychology because no one had, no, most people had studied economics and political science. So, you know, you have to be lucky and things can work out. And then I, to this day, uh, I'm still surprised that when I got that phone call and they told me I was uh, one of the 20. And uh, so I am the unlikely diplomat. Well, before we go into your diplomatic career, tell us a little bit about your high school year in New Jersey. Uh, you think you're outside of Atlantic City. Tell us yes. about that experience. Yes, no, it was truly fascinating. This was 1982, 1983. Uh, so I became senior in high school. Uh, first, I lived with one family that didn't work out. And as I told you, I'm an only child. So I wasn't used to living in a family with a lot of children. Uh, but yeah, so I, I'm very proud that I managed to move. I mean, it was a tough decision at that age, uh, of course. And and uh, there were no other there were no other exchange students at the school where I was. So I was in a way quite lonely. And uh, then I moved into a wonderful family, uh, stayed with them uh, in Eckerb Township. Uh, very grateful that they they took me under their wings. Uh, but I think in a way. It, I had a pretty hard time. I was too different, I think. So I learned a lot about myself. Uh, I uh, It wasn't easy for me to, to, to get friends there. So I had a few. But it was a personal, really great experience because I, uh, as I said, having grown up as an only child, you're quite spoiled. So I had to, you know, take my fights and, and see what it is like. I had very many friends in Sweden that still do, but that year was a bit of a challenge. But I learned a lot about the United States. Uh, extremely happy I went, extremely proud that I didn't go home because, I mean, that was something I was contemplating. But uh, and then then coming back as a student later on at university was fantastic. I love your country. So it's not that it was just a tough experience for me personally, but it made me grow. So I'm, all those experiences add to your life experience, which is good, I think. So one should always take those opportunities, even though maybe it doesn't turn out as, as you thought it would be. Well, tell us a little bit about your time at UCLA then. You studied management. I think it's the Anderson School. Yes. Uh, oh, that was just, I mean, living in Westwood, Los Angeles, 1992, uh, a fantastic university. Uh, and I, I, I don't know if you realize, uh, those of you who are listening, but your professors at your universities and college, they are world class. And usually they also have, many of them, especially in management, they have a, had a career in business. Our universities also have great university professors, of course, but usually they have stuck with the university track. So here it's much more um, 
uh, you know, accepted that the, the professors move in and out of academia, which I think really brings a lot of real life experience and you learn a lot. So I learned more one year at the business school in, in Los Angeles and I did four years in Lund and Lund is a good university. <laughs> so, and, you know, I just loved it. I learned so much, uh, had so much fun, uh, got great friends and no, terrific time. And only one small earthquake, because that was my big worry. The year before had been, but in the spring before, there were some quite big earthquakes in Los Angeles. Right. So, no, loved it. Well, let's talk about your first posting then was in Moscow. And mm -hmm. I think you actually worked on security issues. Um, yeah. Uh, particularly, I think, focusing on Belarus. Tell us about your, the, the Moscow experience. Yes, that was my first posting as a diplomat. And I really wanted to go there as my first posting, because I realized if I didn't, uh, I would forget the language. And also, as I said, I, I truly love Russia and the, and the culture and the people. And uh, so um, we didn't have an embassy in Belarus at the time. So I was kind of the desk officer responsible for Belarus. So I traveled there every two, three months, got to know the country, fantastic country, fantastic people, you know, having been overrun by history and the troop, the military troops going back and forth uh, over the centuries. Um, fantastic culture and so on. But of course, uh, President Lukashenko was elected already in 1994 and he was elected on a market economy agenda, believe it or not, today. And he's still there. Uh, and of course, has a, has a very strong grip on that, on that country and uh, represses his people and so on. But it was, it was truly fascinating. So, uh, and then I also um, did a little, lot of reporting on, um, uh, on social issues in Russia. So I learned a lot about the transformation process uh, of Russia in the 1990s. And I think sometimes maybe we were a bit naive in thinking how fast uh, you can transform a country. We thought that the market market uh, economy would, you know, just change the society, but it takes generations, of course, uh, and we're all different as well. Uh, so so it, it's, it wasn't as easy as we perceived uh, the changes to be uh, in the mid 90s, I would say. Well, we could talk about all the various postings because they're very interesting. In fact, we'd like to do that on another occasion. But let's let's talk about uh, your posting about a decade ago as the deputy chief of mission at the Swedish embassy. And for those who maybe don't follow the intricacies of diplomacy, the number per two person, it's sort of like you know, there's a captain of the ship, the ambassador, and then the uh, a DCM is sort of in the engine room, making sure that the uh, the engine is firing yeah. and you're going the right direction. Tell us about that experience, and then maybe particularly about how that's informed how you approach your job as ambassador. Well, I, I as I told you, I truly love your country, and uh, and you Americans are the most open, talkative people. And here in Washington, everyone loves politics. <laughs> so no matter who you are, where you are, and I had little kids at the time. Well, we had little kids, so all the parents we got to know through school are still our best friends here today when we come back. And it's always politics, which I absolutely love. And that was the time when um, President Obama was elected. Uh, I came here in August 2008. Uh, and, you know, it was Obama, Biden against McCain and Sarah Palin. And I think uh, Sarah Palin and that I mean, you know, we also had that was just in the run up to the, the economic crisis that we already started seeing. Uh, so it was tough economic years here, uh, of course. And that I think uh, some of the frustrations that we see in the political landscape today and the polarization, it probably started earlier. But also Sarah Palin, in a way, gave that a political face. So that's when it kind of started. So I think it's today looking back. And uh, and and uh, looking at the polarization of the United States, the society here, I, I, I can see those trends having started already then with that certain type of rhetoric and so on. But uh, what was, uh, you know, it's very rare that we get to serve twice in a posting and come back as an ambassador, but it's so useful because a lot of the people I got to know in the Obama administration, they are now recycled in the Biden administration. And they are, of course, much more senior people now. So, so I have, I think, uh, pers uh, excellent contacts, both on a personal level, because uh, then we were more junior, all of us. <laughs> and we, uh, we met in a different way. And now I, I have these contacts. Uh, and, and it means a lot that you show up again. So I, I am very grateful for that. And uh, I, of course, 
uh, the United States, uh, you know, we are a member of the European Union, and that's our most uh, important foreign policy uh, area, but also for a lot of domestic reasons. You know, we are very linked. Uh, it's in a way like the United States, but a different version of it. But uh, when, then when it comes to, to foreign relations, our relationship with the United States is the most important uh, for us. We are deep transatlanticists. Uh, we build our security on a relationship with you uh, and with NATO and, and, and some other countries, but it is paramount for us. And you're also the driving force when it comes to democracy, human rights, uh, economy, uh, trade, etc. So, so it's fantastic to be back and to to see uh, both how things have changed, but also that you some of your challenges are the same. And also, yeah, no, it's great. It's fantastic. No, I should add that Sweden has one of the great embassies in Washington. It's right on the banks of the Potomac, close to the Kennedy Center. Uh, I, I was uh, reporting and, and watching the House of Sweden as it emerged, I think, in 2005 and six. Tell us a little bit about just the embassy itself. It's one of the largest Swedish embassies in the world. Tell us a little bit about the structure of, of your yeah, embassy. Yeah, we're uh, 55 people, which is huge for being Swedish. If it was a U.S. embassy, I don't think it would even open. <laughs> so half of us are sent out from Sweden, from various ministries and agencies, and uh, half of us uh, are local employees. Uh, great, great uh, staff, I must say, very, very very good people. We are located, as you said, in the heart of Georgetown by the Potomac River. And these days, when you know people are so busy, it's all about location. So if I want to, you know, have a member of Congress or someone from the administration to come, that person cannot take 20 or 30 minutes in a taxi to go up to, for instance, we had an old residence that we talked about earlier uh, that we are now selling. And we are, so we are moving in everything to this building. So the embassy, we have a huge uh, exhibition center, kind of like, a, and we do concerts here and, and uh, seminars, I mean, in normal times. And now we do most of things virtual, uh, but we will also have the ambassador's residence in here. So me and my family, we just moved in on the top floor uh, and the fourth floor of the embassy will be like our, uh, how do you say, our representative, uh, or like the dining hall and the kitchen for the chef and all that. So we're locating everything here because we have this fantastic building that everyone knows about in the city, but also because of its location. It's much, much closer and it's much easier to attract the people you want to see. So, no, extremely happy. And if, if you do come here to Washington, those of you who are listening, you must come and see us. We have a very nice exhibit hall. Right now we have an exhibit on mobility, the future of mobility. We are opening up an exhibit soon called Arctic Highway. Uh, it's for free, open on the weekend. So please, please do come. Well, let's talk for a second about diplomacy in the age of COVID, because a, a couple uh, a month or two ago, we had a wonderful conversation with the EU's ambassador, and he was saying kind of teasingly, he says, diplomacy is a contact sport. Yes, Stavros he, always says that. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and he means that I think in both the sense of contacts, you know, personal relationships, and also maybe the competition of, you know, competing for the eye of, of Washington, in the ear of Washington policymakers. But I mean, this last year and a half must be deeply... Um, difficult in terms of both managing a staff and also managing a, a complex diplomatic relationship mm. virtually. Mm. No, and uh, I agree with you. First of all, of course, it's the management part of it. That's for any organization. And to make sure that people who, when we work at home, we don't see each other. So you don't know how people actually feel. And that has been a challenge to make sure and try to make sure that people are okay mentally. And a lot of us, I have older children, but a lot of us had, you know, had to juggle work and schooling and helping the, the younger children. And that that's an enormous effort it takes. So we've been, you know, quite clear that we have to handle our families, but we also have to work. But, you know, of course, the workload was much less, but still it was it was a challenge for many. So that was the most important one. And then when it comes to diplomacy, I think I am lucky in the sense I, as I told you, I have worked here before. So I know a lot of people already. So it was easier to just phone them up. Uh, and the ones I knew could vouch for me for the uh, for the other for the new ones I was calling and so on. So I was surprised that it worked fairly well. I mean, just like we have a conversation now, I had, you know, conversations with people at the NSC who I had never met. <laughs> so, and then of course, uh, with the Trump administration, we had already gotten to know them 
Uh, so the last year of the Trump administration, the first year of COVID, I had those contacts already. So, so that was okay. We also did the first virtual visit of a foreign minister to the United States. So we actually made um, uh, everything that you do in a, in, a, in a real visit, we did online. So she spoke at the think tank. Uh, she met with the staff. She made interviews. She had uh, meetings online with uh, her counterparts and so on. So there was ways of doing it. And I think one of the few silver linings of this, if there is any, is what we are doing today. I don't know if we would have been doing this pre-COVID, then I probably would have traveled to you and maybe 20 people would have listened, not 76. So there's, this is, I think, something that I hope we take with us uh, in diplomacy and in, in, in public diplomacy and outreach that we continue to do these things virtually because we, re we can do hybrid, right? but we, we reach each other uh, in a totally different way. Right. Well, one of the central features of an ambassador's job is to explain their country to the United States. Mm -hmm. And so what when you talk about Sweden to people in the administration, to members of Congress, to the American people in universities and other settings, what is the central message that you like to communicate about Sweden? Well, of course, we're a fairly small country in the, in the north. Uh, our geographical size is the size of California but only with 10 million people. But uh, if you look at most rankings in the world, when it comes to gender equality, innovation, et cetera, et cetera, we rank top 10 uh, on, on a lot of things. So I'm very proud of our society. Uh, I also try to explain to them what it means to be a market economy with a welfare state, because we often get, uh, now I'm joking, so excuse me, but either we get called socialist hell by the far right or socialist paradise, by the far left, and I tell them we're just paradise. <laughs> we're not socialists. That's a misconception. So I think many Americans, understandably so, think that we're some kind of version of some socialist, uh, communist uh, society. No, we're not. So we are a, a strong market economy. Uh, uh, for instance, we've had uh, when you had a tax rate of 28 for corporate taxes, we've already had around 20. So it's not, yes, we have high taxes for the population, but that also gives you, you know, access to free health care, uh, daycare, uh, free schooling, free, uh, so free university in the sense that we paid through it by our taxes, elderly care. My own father is 91 years old. He has home care five, six times a day, which is paid through uh, taxes. So, uh, and at the same time, you know, we're one of the biggest, we're the 15th largest investor in the United States. Uh, so we have fantastic companies that you probably know of, H&M, Ericsson, Volvo, ABV. So we're a combination of, of, of having the safety net and a strong market economy. Right. So, so that's what I try to tell, tell uh, American friends and that they should come and visit, of course. After most people come when they've done everything else in Europe. <laughs> Well, someone who's visited Stockholm, I would say it's one of the most beautiful cities I've ever visited. It's yeah. just magnificent, and I'm eager to see uh, to see more of Sweden. Well, so I mean, the one part of the job is is explaining um, uh, Sweden to America, and mm -hmm. the other part of your job is to explain America to Sweden, particularly mm -hmm. the government and uh, and you know interviews and so forth. And it seems to me that I mean, you have this deep history in the United States, but this is a pretty hard country to explain right now, and I. Um, you know, obviously, people back home are watching CNN and reading newspapers, so they, they know what's happening. But to explain really what's going on here seems challenging. And I was just thinking of a, an op-ed that was in the New York Times a week ago by Jimmy Carter, the former president, yeah. who began by saying, I mean, the, 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 uh, the title was, I fear for our democracy. And he says, our great nation now teeters on the brink of a widening abyss. Without immediate action, we are at genuine risk of civil conflict and losing our precious democracy. Americans must set aside differences and work together before it's too late. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, people in Stockholm must be saying to you, what in the name of God is going on there? Because the United States, for as much of it as kind of lurching back and forth, has been a relatively stable country for the last 75 years at least. Absolutely. So, so what, what are you saying? Well, first of all, you know, uh, Swedes in general, uh, we are, 
maybe one of the countries in in Europe which have the strongest link to American culture. And we've had that for a long time, since after the war, uh, I would say. So so we have, of our, of our 10 million people, I mean, I'm talking now pre-COVID, about four or 500,000 Swedes visit the United States every year. But they, most of them, of course, visit New York and Los Angeles. So the East Coast and the West Coast. So first of all, we try to get both our politicians and other people to, to visit other parts of America. This is a continent uh, and it's called the United States of America. And I think a lot of Europeans don't understand or don't know uh, how much power the individual state has. And we can see that, I mean, coming back to, to President Carter's uh, article that, no, just talking about voting rights, that's also this, the individual state decides how their voting system will be and how you, you know, all this. So first of all, I think it's extremely important for, for foreigners to understand much deeper what the United States is. It's easy to see all those fantastic TV shows. We all follow, you know, all of it. <laughs> but you have to you have to understand that it's a continent. And of course, just like in my country, there are areas uh, in your country where, for instance, um, job transformation hasn't really happened. Uh, people feel uh, feel like they are not part of the future economy. We are in a big transition when it comes to technology. Maybe one of the biggest in in the history of mankind since we invented the wheel. Uh, so, so of course, there are a lot of stress in society, and given the technology we have, we are becoming more polarized. It's the same in my country. It's just stronger here uh, somehow because we still have, you know, two teeny TV channels where you can watch the news, and that's people trust one news source more than here, for instance. So, I think we have a bigger trust in our politicians in Sweden. Uh, than you do. We have very big trust, actually, both population to the politicians, politicians to the people. So, for instance, that's why during COVID, my country, uh, we uh, worked on recommendations and the politicians expect the population to follow the recommendations. So it's a different way of looking at things. And, and I think it's, uh, I mean, I'm very... I'm an optimist about the United States. You've gone, th gone through so many various, you know, really hard uh, development issues in your country. But I still believe in the institutions uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and your strong democratic um, uh, sense and, and pride in your country. So uh, I'm an optimist, even though I know it is very hard times now. And I, I'm going to be honest, um, you have to succeed. <laughs> For all of us, uh, because you are the superpower and you are the shine. What do you call it? Uh, shining light on the hill, or however it's uh, it's an said. But that that is very important. I had a conversation with a Swedish diplomat um, uh, a few months before our 2020 election, and I said, "What do you think?" And he said, "I think it's the most important election in Sweden's history." Yes. No. No. Sweden. You know. People are so engaged in your politics, more engaged, I would say, than in our own politics almost. Uh, yes, Donald Trump, President Trump, he could not tweet uh, without it becoming an article in my country. So uh, we are very engaged in your politics. Well, let's talk to, uh, for a few minutes about COVID because, um, you know, Sweden was, if I could be candid, kind of dragged mm -hmm. into American political debate on COVID. You had a, a policy that, you know, people on the right and left kind of appropriated to kind of make their own points. And I was struck by an article that you wrote in the LA Times in which you, you explained Sweden's policy. But then you said, and I, I like to quote, you said, it's a strategy that makes sense for Sweden, but we are humble enough to admit that it may make less sense elsewhere because all societies are different. Mm -hmm. And you went on to say Sweden's strategy may not provide all the answers, but we believe the combination of voluntary and mandated measures is not only more sustainable for Sweden than a lockdown strategy, but will strengthen resilience of Swedish society to fight the virus in the long run. Yeah. So tell, I wonder a couple of things. One, explain a little bit about your diplomacy when Sweden was being pulled into the discussion here, mm -hmm. but also maybe more broadly how Sweden is dealing with COVID. I saw a really stunning article in the New York Times 
Times this week in which they predict that maybe half of Europeans will contract COVID in the coming months. I mean, it's obviously the new variant is spreading across yeah. the world. So tell us about COVID in Sweden. Well, uh, as you rightly pointed out from that article, we have had we had a policy um, that was based on recommendations, uh, as I said, and that's by law. That's how our law on epidemiology is stated. It has to be recommendations. And also early on, our public health agency saw when they looked at China, that initially with the first variant of COVID, children didn't really get sick. And their response, so I mean, I think one of the biggest differences between Sweden and other countries was that we never closed the schools or daycare for uh, children up to ninth grade. So what happened was they saw that children didn't get sick and for and the public health agency has to take a kind of whole of society and whole of uh, person approach. So uh, they realized that it's better for the children to be in school, uh, both for education, but also mentally. And also, if we would close down the schools, we would lose 30 percent of our healthcare workers because the Swedish society is a society where both parents or parents work. So we have an employment rate of 80-85%, which is like 15, I think, almost 15 or 10% higher than here. So that, that's the one reason. And then, of course, like everywhere else, uh, one of the big challenges we had was, was uh, our elderly care facilities. And uh, that uh, elderly care facilities in Sweden, uh, you, like I told you earlier, my father, for instance, he has home care. I think in many other countries, he might live in an elderly care facility or nursing home. But he, so you move into nursing home when you are so weak or so, and your dementia, dementia is so strong that you absolutely cannot live at home, any, home anymore. So the people who, who are in our uh, elderly care facilities are, uh, are very frail. So uh, when we didn't, as in many countries, uh, and this is no excuse, uh, got uh, the virus into the elderly care facility, of course, people passed away. What's interesting now uh, is that when you look at excess death, and I just saw a survey the other week of the 40 countries in Europe, I think it was, I don't know if United States was part of that, uh, was uh, they rated for over death for last year. And we were fourth from the bottom. So all in all, this was an experiment for so many of us. Uh, but when you look at excess death, uh, we fared quite well. Of course, it's awful for everyone who's lost someone uh, to COVID. But if you look at the at excess deaths, uh, we are, we are not that much. Uh, we're actually fairly good, if one can talk about uh, say it like that. So, of course, the decision uh, all aimed to you know limit the spread of the infection in the country. So, seventy percent of the people worked at home, uh, and we are actually now tightening that. So, uh, it's really going back to saying that everyone who can should work at home. Uh, and that's being followed. Um, and of course, uh, also ensure the healthcare resources that they are available. There's been a huge strain on, on the intensive care and, and our hospitals, of course, and a discussion on, on uh, other uh, surgery that had to be pushed forward. Uh, that's also, of course, part of it. And also limit the impact on critical services was very important. And of course, mitigate the effects on people and businesses. So it's basically the same philosophy behind it is just done in a little bit of a different way. And uh, yes, we were uh, used uh, in the political discussion here uh, because there was a perception that we, life just went on as normal in Sweden. And of course it didn't, but it wasn't a lockdown uh, as in many other places. So of course our industry was hurt, uh, you know, 45% uh, of our GDP comes from trade with others. Uh, I think the same number in the United States is 12 or 15. So we are very dependent on global value chains and all, and all that, of course, came to a halt. So for the business community, it was also hard. Um, but we just did it in a different way. And, and, uh, and as I said in that article, all societies are different. So it's very hard to compare. But no, we were used. And then our friends uh, on the more left side, you know, were extremely upset with uh, or upset with our policy. And so, so we had to explain in both 
both directions, <laughs> of course. And you never want to be, uh, you know, uh, the punch ball <laughs> right. in any any in any way. But uh, I think I I appreciate that I got so much room to explain. Right. Well, let's talk about another big issue, which Sweden is very interested in, as really all of us are, which is climate change. And, and mm -hmm. Sweden has been a real innovator, um, has sort of broken the link between carbon emissions and growth and has shown how you can really grow mm -hmm. robustly by r reducing carbon. Tell us about where, you know, where, how Sweden views this, uh, this kind of decisive moment. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So in my country, there is political unity across uh, all sectors that uh, climate change is a real threat uh, to, or an existential threat even to our societies, and we must take this really, really serious, and we must all speed up, you know, uh, our efforts to to reach uh, the goals of the P Paris Agreement. And we are so happy that the United States is back. Because as I said, uh, you are uh, really important for global affairs. Uh, whatever you do is followed by others. So uh, you are always an inspiration. So, so, so that was really a very important decision by the Biden administration that we are very, very happy about. So uh, we have a climate act, uh, and that's an obligation then to pursue a climate policy based on uh, the climate uh, goals that are adopted by our parliament. And we are then committed to trying to take a leading role when it comes to technological development uh, to fight climate change. Uh, so we have set very ambitious goals uh, for this. So we aim to be the first fossil free welfare nation uh, and achieve net uh, zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2045. And uh, by uh, 2030, emissions from uh, domestic transport will be reduced by at least 70% compared to 2010. And this excludes aviation, but aviation is included in the EU frame framework. So it's not that we are ignoring uh, air transportation or aviation, that's part of the package as well. And also we have uh, one of the highest shares of renewable energy uh, among the EU member states. So about 80% of our electricity production comes from nuclear and hydroelectric power. And 12% comes, uh, comes from wind power. So now when we have all the gas discussions in Europe on, on Russian gas and so on, uh, it doesn't concern us as, as a nation because we don't, uh, we don't be, you know, our energy usage doesn't come from those sources. But there is quite a big debate now on nuclear power in my country. Again, we have elections coming up in September. Uh, but so, as I said, half of uh, for, uh, for about 40% energy from nuclear and 40% of uh, comes from hydro. Uh, so, of course, we are fortunate that we have the possibility with hydro, hydro as well. And then also... Um, we are really good at recycling. Only 1% of our waste actually goes to landfills. And one thing I think you should really do in the United States is to start uh, recycling bottles and cans. So as an example, uh, we uh, have a long history with bot uh, depositing cans and, and uh, bottles. And we get, get, you get money back when you recycle. So it, when you go to the grocery store, there's a machine and you put in your can and you get like 10 cents or something like that for the can. Uh, and that really makes people recycle. So we actually, out of you know, 10 million people lost uh, each year, we recycle 1.8 billion bottles uh, and cans. And there's even a verb for this, it's called panta. Uh, so, so it's it's really been ingrained in our in our minds that you know this is what we do, and I think you could uh, hear this is something you should be inspired by. If I may tell you something, what you should do, uh, but also our um, uh, legislation allows buyers of low emission cars to get a climate bonus for that. I know that's also something that's discussed here in the United States. And uh, we also have made it easier and uh, beneficial for households to invest in solar power. And then um, maybe one of the most important things is that uh, the Swedish business communities, uh, they have taken on a program called Fossil Free Sweden. So about 450 companies, uh, uh, and uh, I think it's from 22 or 25 different uh, sectors, 
have committed to this. And this means that they are making roadmaps for like the cement industry. How do we become, uh, reduce our carbon footprint? When do we, how do we make a roadmap to become fossil free? We have now the two first fossil free steel plants in Sweden. We've cracked the code. It will be on the market in a couple of years. Uh, and, and that will be beneficial for the United States as well, because those companies are also invested in the United States. So we are making a fossil free steel, which, of course, the car industry is extremely interested in. It will be a little bit more expensive, but on the margin. But, you know, that, that's a big reducer. So I really think um, both the steel is called hybrid. Uh, it's called hydrogen breakthrough iron making technology. Uh, so uh, last year, Volvo Group, actually the truck company, uh, launched the wor uh, world's first vehicle made of fossil free steel. So there's lots going on. We take it very seriously. There is big commitment, I would say, in the Swedish population uh, to do this. But you can always argue we should all do more. <laughs> we need to do more uh, as well. So so but we're on on a on a on a good track. Great. Ambassador, let's go to a couple of questions that have been emailed uh -huh. in. Um, the first one comes from uh, Jennifer in Chicago and wants to get your assessment of this Swedish-American bilateral relationship, asking what are the points of, of agreement and what are the, the kind of the major points of contention? Yes. Uh, well, uh, uh, we have a great relationship, I would say. Uh, I've had since, uh, you know, a long time. We were one of the first countries to recognize the United States uh, in the 1700s. Uh, and uh, has ever since, you know, had a good relationship. One fourth of our population actually left for the United States. Uh, so, so, so we have very strong ties, as I've talked about. Trade and defense uh, are some of our most, or maybe our most important uh, issues. Um, when it comes to trade, as I said, we're the 15th largest investor in your country. We create about 400,000 or 350, 400,000 jobs here. Uh, and just in Illinois, I think it's around 13,000 jobs. Uh, so that's a big, big uh, issue. And also, of course, uh, when it comes to trade, that's both very positive, but we are also concerned when you are uh, going in a protectionist uh, direction with a very strong Buy American or uh, America First uh, kind of policies. We were, of course, upset when there were steel and aluminum tariffs uh, put on us because of national security reasons. We are a partner to you. We are not a threat. Uh, and we think this is counterproductive because we truly believe in free trade and, and as open uh, trading channels as possible to create more jobs and prosperity for all of us. So that's one point of contention, I would say. Uh, uh, but we let you know when we are discontent. <laughs> then when it comes to defense, uh, as I said, Sweden is not a member of NATO. Uh, but we build our security on cooperation with others. So uh, we are, uh, together with Finland, enhanced partners to NATO. And of course, now, given the situation in Ukraine, uh, that's coming even more at the, in the spotlight. But we build our security with a very strong cooperation with you. Uh, so lots of military uh, exercises together. Uh, Swedes coming here, American uh, soldiers, military capabilities coming to Sweden. Uh, we are developing defense materials. Sweden, because of our history as a militarily non-aligned country, have a huge uh, defense industry. So we build our own fighter jets. We are going to build our own uh, submarines. We are uh, revamping because of the, our vicinity, spending so much more on defense. And there, our relationship with you is really important. And that works well. Uh, I, we were, of course, worried uh, when, um, I mean, we also cooperate globally when it comes to democracy, human rights, uh, development cooperation. Sweden gives 1% of GDP in development cooperation, and there you are a very important partner. So we are very happy that the Biden administration has come back to, to what's called the Mexico City Policy Plan, where we can work on sexual and reproductive health rights for women and, and well, anyone uh, globally. Uh, so, of course, that was tough during the previous administration where we didn't see eye to eye on that. But but now we do and, and we cooperate very well. So over time, depending on administrations, there are always things where we don't see eye to eye, but on the big scale, we do. Hmm. Lawrence from Quincy poses a simple question. Any any su suggestions for strengthening democracy? Well, I think what we, we what we must do is really start with the children. Uh, we must educate children on how you, how do you, uh, how do you say, 
judge the social media flows? How do you make sure what what's what's correct information? What is what are facts? What are not facts? And how do you? I I I I really think this is what we must do. We are doing it uh, in in the Swedish schools. Maybe not. Uh, I mean, it's there. Maybe more can be done. But I think this is something we must really focus on. It's the youth, the children, to teach them about democracy and teach them critical thinking. It's extremely important. And you might just briefly mention this, uh, an initiative that Sweden has come out with called the Psychological Defense Agency, which I think tries to get at this uh, this kind of thread of fake news and disinformation. Mm -hmm. Actually, you know, during the Cold War, uh, we had an e even bigger defense than we had today. So we had an agency called the Agency for Psychological Defense. And, you know, the dismantling of the Soviet Union, uh, we all uh, kind of cut down our defense sectors and so on, because we thought that we didn't need it anymore. But now, unfortunately, we have to ramp up our security again. And we have realized also with the introduction of new technology and, and social media and all that, that we also need to have an agency that looks out for disinformation uh, that can teach other um, other uh, agencies and companies about you know what what to do and how to 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 be safe for for these kind of in, uh, issues so it will the, the the agency will analyze and support efforts to counter attempts to elicit uh, information and influence and uh, coercion in the swedish society that's one task and the other one will then to be contributing to readiness education and exercises and also research and development in the field of of, of this and also in case of a war or a crisis the agency will also support the government uh, to stop an aggression towards Sweden. So it's a very broad mandate uh, and it's kind of based on what we had before, but of course with living in the new reality, uh, this is what it will do. So I, I think it's, and uh, there's huge curiosity here in Washington on this agency. Uh, it just started 1st of January and, and um, I'm sure if you would like to have a discussion with them uh, later on when they are a bit more up and running, I'm sure they would love to 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 be part of a discussion like this and explain more in detail. I mean, it unfortunately we need it, and we all see it because we have to uh, we have to, as I said, be very vigilant in, in what kind of information is spread in our countries and what is true and what is not true. Okay, John from Carbondale asks how the current debate on migration is altering. Um, the structure of Swedish society. I might just say parenthetically, I was doing some research and I think Sweden and maybe in just one year, 2015, brought in 150,000 migrants, which for, you know, in a country of 10 million, I mean, that's sort of like Illinois bringing in a city like the size of, you know, larger than Peoria or Springfield. So Sweden has mm -hmm. brought in an enormous number of, 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 of people from other countries. And so how has that altered your society and the political discussion? Yeah, um, well, it is a big political issue and I will come to that. Uh, but to put it in perspective, in 2020, there was uh, uh, considered to be around 280 million international migrants in the world. So there are a lot of people who are uh, feel they have to leave their, their home and uh, their home countries. So in Sweden, about 2 million people uh, or every fifth person was born in another country. Uh, and the most common reasons to move to Sweden, then most people come to Sweden for work. That's the biggest bunch. It's also to re reunite with close family members. So people who have gotten asylum status and are refugees, they then can bring their families. And that's the, that's the biggest bunch today. Uh, so we, uh, uh, we have... Ever since the Second World War, I would say, been a country of uh, immigrations, first from Germany and the other Nordic and Baltic countries um, were the bulk of the post-war uh, immigrants. Many of them then went back to their homes. And then in the 70s, a huge group of people from Chile uh, with a uh, coup there. And in the 90s, we saw a rise of asylum seekers from Iraq and Iran, Syria, Turkey, Eritrea and Somalia. Uh, and also some South American countries. And in the 1990s, of course, the war in the Balkans uh, made a huge group of people coming from Yugo former Yugoslavia. So about 100,000 people from Bosnia and uh, around 4,000 Kosovar Albanians uh, were granted asylum. 
And then, uh, so we have we have a long tradition of receiving people uh, from uh, or refugees from active war zones. And then, as you said, in 2015, an unprecedented uh, number of uh, people sought asylum in, in Sweden, around uh, 160,000 people. Uh, and of course, it was the civ uh, civil war in Syria uh, and also Afghanistan that uh, gave rise to this. So since those days, in that time, it was the issue of political was migration as such. Now it's integration. How do we make sure uh, that the people who are granted asylum and who come to live in Sweden uh, then can take part in our society? How do we teach them our language the best? Uh, how do we make sure that they um, integrate and, and uh, integrate into the workforce and society and, and, and so on? So this this is a big topic, and and uh, we'll it's debated already now. Uh, it's been for 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 years now, but uh, we have elections coming in September, and this is one of the biggest issues actually on on, on this. So um, it's both a domestic issue, but we also must find global solutions in a way to to uh, strengthen and uh, manage the movement of people and migrants, uh, so that people don't need to leave. <laughs> This comes everything, you know, it's about wars. It's about how do we fight the wars? How do we, you know, strengthen our development cooperation so we, you know, people can have a good livelihood from where they are? I mean, there's so many issues uh, that, that play in hand here and, and international cooperation here is, is crucial, of course. So uh, actually, but just to say, the largest immigration group to Sweden are returning Swedes. Uh, but of course, we do see a lot of people from other parts of the world as well. We want to see more Americans to come and study as well and work in Sweden. So you're so welcome. <laughs> Great. Charles from Chicago asks, um, he says a, a recent Financial Times article uh, reported growing concerns in Sweden and Finland that both countries face Russian demands to distance themselves from NATO. You made reference to that earlier. Tell us, I mean, given particularly given your expertise on, on Russia, what how you read this current uh, kind of tense uh, situation involving Russia and Ukraine and, and, and also into the Baltic uh, region? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, we are in an extremely serious uh, situation right now. My our Swedish foreign minister was here last week to have uh, talks with American counterparts. And you all follow the discussions now uh, bilaterally between Russia and the United States and then uh, with NATO and Russia and now at the OSCE, I think today. So, of course, it is extremely important that we solve this uh, conflict uh, or tensions uh, diplomatically, that, that uh, we do everything we can so that we don't end up in a military in a military situation. And what we have been very concerned with is, of course, the Russian demands uh, that NATO should uh, uh, close its door to enlargement, uh, that uh, uh, troops or military capabilities should not be put in countries that join NATO after 1997, etc., not respecting each country's individual right to choose their security. That's the fundament of the of all of it. So, for instance, my country uh, right now doesn't have an interest in joining NATO, but believe that we believe that should be our choice, not anyone else's choice. And this is the you know fundamental uh, to European and world security order. So, uh, what we see now uh, with the Russian demands and and, and the troop buildup uh, along the Ukrainian border and and the attacks that Russia has done earlier, both on Georgia and of course Crimea are extremely serious. Uh, we also see hybrid threats, uh, ransomware attacks. We had one in Sweden last summer um, when one of our biggest food chains uh, got uh, attacked and so on. So we are, of course, very concerned about the Russian military buildup uh, along the border of uh, Ukraine. Um, and um, it's important that we all now try to find ways to de-escalate and find solutions as this, but we must safeguard uh, the, the principles we have on security in Europe. So, you know, because we've seen the writing on the wall for quite some time, we have increased our defense spending. Uh, we are now to 2025 increasing by 40%. As I said earlier, we are uh, producing our own fighter jets. We are now going into uh, ramping that up. We are building new submarines. We are going back to a conscript army again, uh, which, we, which we scrapped for some years. Um, we are building new military bases and we are increasing our cooperation with others. So 
very close cooperation with Finland, uh, want to increase our cooperation with NATO. Um, Prime Minister just said that the other day, that we want to deepen that even more, uh, and with the United States and others. So, so I think we believe we are in dangerous times, and, and we really must uh, do everything we can uh, to, 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 to de-escalate. And, and respect, uh, that there is respect for, for each country's sovereign choices. Well, what would you say to students who are considering a career in diplomacy? What, um, what, what are the rewards? What are the challenges? I know in many cases, diplomats are away from families for mm -hmm. extended periods of times and, and so forth. But how, as, you, as you've, you know, in the middle of a really amazing career, how do you, uh, what do you say to students about a career in diplomacy? I mean, I, uh, I'm always curious when I meet people who work in other sectors of business. And then I, when I listen to them, I, I'm content with it, that I have the best one. Mine is most interesting because if you are interested and prepared to move, you know, you always learn something new every day uh, and you meet fascinating people. And just like the discussion we have now, uh, to me, that's amazing that you're so interested in my country. And, uh, you know, so that's one part, the curiosity, living in other countries, representing your country. If you are proud of your country, that's something that's fantastic. I mean, all countries have flaws, but I'm very proud of my country. So I love doing that. And then I, the experience with people and learning, and I love politics. So that's one thing. Then, of course, it's family life. That can be a challenge. Uh, so you, if you want to have a partner, you have to choose a partner who is also ready to come with. And also, you know, uh, I remember when I started a diplomatic career, we were all joking, like we should all marry poets and painters. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm very lucky with my husband that he has wanted to to come with and that he also sees this as a as an opportunity because I mean the the spouse uh, many times have to leave their career behind and that's a lot to ask for someone. And then of course it's hard to say how this is for children uh, if it's uh, good for them or or not good for them. I think it's both because they don't me as having if we tie tie it all together having grown up in this city where my friends are still my friends from when i was 10 of course my children they don't have that because they've moved but hopefully they have something different uh, that another life experience that is good for them so there are many things to take into con consideration but i mean if it's only you uh, and you don't have a partner or, or, or so then it's just great <laughs> But it's a big responsibility towards your family, of course, and I'm forever grateful to, to mine uh, that they also want to do this and experience this. So, no, it's a fascinating job. I just love it. And imagine, I mean, the United States is everywhere. You can be posted anywhere. So, um, really, I, I can highly recommend it. But you have to learn languages. That's right. Well, let me ask you finally how you like to relax. And I was looking at your biography and I saw three strains that I'd like you to kind of develop at one. I, I, I don't know if this was just at a younger age, golf. You, mm -hmm. Second, I, I heard that you love the musical Grease. <laughs> and the third one, I know this is different, but you spent six months uh, as a bartender in New Zealand, which I took yes. as kind of a code for international adventures and travel. So yeah. Weave those through three experiences I'm into. I'm older now, <laughs> <laughs> and I've seen Greece. I love Greece, but still, no. I I spend a lot of my free time. The free time I love reading. Uh, I really do love reading. Um, so that's a lot of. I also love uh, films and movies, and so, like so many others, we are caught up in you know the Netflix, HBO. Uh, watching of things uh, so so that's enjoy enjoyment I do love to cook uh, now I haven't really had so much time but I'm having we are having friends over tomorrow and uh, I really look forward to cooking for them I think it's both relaxing and enjoyable because you get instant results and usually it's fairly good <laughs> no and I do play golf I love golf and the day I retire I will wear only pink and live on the golf course. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, Ambassador, it's been really a delightful conversation. We've really enjoyed visiting with you. And as we were saying uh, offline, when, when circumstances allow, we'd love to invite you to Carbondale. And uh, I know there's a huge Swedish presence in Illinois, yes, something yes. like 250,000 Illinoisans yes. have some Swedish roots. So yes, um, a lot of them are in Chicago, but also throughout the state. So we'd love to invite you to Illinois and to uh, to see a part of the, the country that... Uh, 
you know, not all diplomats have a chance to visit. Mm. No, and your country has so much to offer and just your nature is spectacular, of course. So, no, we'd love to come. Great. Well, again, so, thank and you. Also, when, if you, any one of you listening, come to DC, come and look us up. Embassy is right on the Potomac in Georgetown. We're open on the weekends and we have a great cultural program and also follow us online in our social media channels. We put on, you know, discussions and we do so much virtual these days. So I hope you get to enjoy that as well. Great. Well, again, Ambassador, thank you so much and, and stay safe. And we look forward to hosting you in Carbondale before too much longer. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. It was really, really an honor. Thank you. Take Great. care, everyone. Now stay safe. <laughs> thank you. And wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for watching another edition of our series, Understanding Our New World. We will have this conversation on our YouTube channel tomorrow. So please look at it and show it to family and friends. And, uh, and thank you for supporting the Institute and keeping the memory of Paul Simon alive and well. Thanks so much.